You're listening to Beyond the Plate with Andrew Kaplan. This sounds so weird. You're listening to Beyond the Plate with Cappy. I think like the, the greatest lesson in the business is, you know, you have to be at your restaurants. You have to be there. If you're going to be in the restaurant business, you got to show face. You got to, no one's going to treat your businesses like you do. Hey everyone, this is Cappy and you're listening to Beyond the Plate, a podcast where I sit down in person with the world's culinary elite to explore their journey into the industry and the social impact they have made in their community. Every episode, we share inspiring stories of what it means to be in today's hospitality industry. This is another episode recorded live from the 17th annual Food Network and Cooking Channel South Beach Wine and Food Festival. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Martin's Famous Potato Rolls. Martin's Potato Rolls are the number one branded hamburger bun in America, and as I like to say, they can make almost any burger taste better. If you missed last week's episode, uh, it was our fifth Wednesday episode. It was a bonus episode with Julie Martin of Martin's Family Fame. Please be sure to check that out. There's some really fun behind the scenes stories about the bakery going from literally producing rolls in a garage to now having two huge bakeries, one in Pennsylvania, one in Georgia. And as I like to do in these ad reads is share something how I like to use this product. So recently I needed a really quick and easy way to do a garlic bread. So I took some of their sandwich rolls, toasted them up lightly gave them a little slather of butter, sprinkling of granulated garlic and granulated onion, shaved a little Parmigiano-Reggiano cheese on it because it was sitting on the counter next to me, and why not? And voila, a good, quick, and easy garlic bread. Anyhow, Martins gives back to their community through volunteering time and donating resources. They support hundreds of charitable organizations such as food banks, after-school programs, disaster relief, and others that provide sustenance and comfort to people in need both close to their baking facilities and abroad. So to learn more about Martins, visit their website at potatorolls.com or follow them on social media at Potato Rolls. Martins, we thank you. Okay, back to it. For this episode, we sat with Chef Spike Mendelson. All right, full disclosure, Spike is a friend. I've known Spike for a long time, so I know that he's a very kind and giving individual. This is a chef that doesn't take himself too seriously, as you'll hear. He's incredibly talented and has an enormous culinary background, which also a lot of people don't know because I feel like he came onto the scene when he did Top Chef, the Chicago season. He has this background. He's traveled the world. He's cooked in Luxembourg and Vietnam and a bunch of other countries, actually. He's a dad to a baby with a very sophisticated palate, as you'll hear. Spike grew up in Montreal. He has a big Greek family on one side and Jewish family on the other. I've traveled with Spike to a couple different countries. I had an incredible journey with him in Greece, saw some of his hometown where his mom's side is from. And we went to Jamaica together once too. And we were the two judges for a pan chicken festival in Kingston, which was awesome. But just when you think this guy is like casual and very laid back, I'm excited for you to hear about his work he does philanthropically. He does a lot of work with food policy, giving back nationally and internationally. But on a more formal level, he's a chef, a restaurateur, TV personality, culinary consultant, food policy advocate, father. This guy has been working in kitchens for literally 30 plus years. He's a graduate of CIA, the Culinary Institute of America. He's worked for some incredible chefs, including uh, French master chef Gerard Boyer, which I'm probably butchering that pronunciation. He's worked with Thomas Keller, Sergio Maccioni, Drew Nieperint. But after Top Chef, he's gone on to do, and we joke about this because he's never won, many shows <laughs> such as Life After Top Chef, Iron Chef America, Late Night Chef Fight, Beat Bobby Flay. He's hosted uh, Midnight Feast, Food Network's Kitchen Sink. 
and on and on and on. So back to his restaurant credentials. In 2008, he opened his first restaurant in his culinary empire in, on Washington, D.C.'s Capitol Hill called Good Stuff Eatery, which President Barack Obama frequented. We'll hear more about. He has a cookbook. He has another restaurant called We the Pizza. He has a taqueria now called Santa Rosa Taqueria. Spike is the first chairman of D.C.'s Food Policy Council on behalf of the mayor. And he uses his voice to speak about improving the quality of school lunches, uh, equal access to whole and healthy foods for the protection of the SNAP program, which is food stamps. I could go on and on and on, but I'm going to stop and let you hear our discussion. So I'll stop here and please enjoy this conversation as we go beyond the plate with Chef Spike Mendelson. This is very serious. This is some serious stuff. This is beyond serious. There's fun stuff in this, and then there's um, serious stuff in this because I think we've had both of those conversations. Yeah. And I think there's a lot to learn about Chef Spike Mendelson. But first, here at South Beach Wine and Food Festival, it's the 17th festival, and I know you've been here a number of times, and you've taken home some trophies yes. at Burger Bash. Yes, some wins. But can you explain to people listening why is this festival so special to you? Yeah. You know, I personally, I, I just love seeing the industry. You know, I think it's, you know, I think we're all kind of spread out all over the place, national and even internationally these days. And it's it's great to see, like, you know, your your peers. And, and I, I love just kind of keeping up with everybody and seeing what everyone's up to and uh, as well as definitely goes to a good cause obviously but you know it's just like well that 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 one time of the year where we all get to, together and just kind of hang out so yeah fun spring break for chefs it's spring break for sh- exactly exactly you know we used to have a lot more shenanigans here it's like daddy chef life now it's, it is we'll talk about baby ace we've traveled together jamaica Greece. <laughs> yes. But one of my favorite memories is being on the beach in Greece and you made a regonata, is that? Yeah, regonata. Regonata. Yes. A dish, like a dish that you, I, th- I guess, traditionally. It's a, tra- it's a traditional, like, uh, Greek peasant dish, actually. Yeah. And one of my producers, Sean, he's like, I want him to talk about that dish with the tomato. <laughs> and I was like, why are you asking that? I didn't even put that in my notes. And he's yeah. like, because I remember seeing a picture of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, I actually have a picture of that that time that you, because you took pictures yeah. of it and framed it, uh, and it's in my it's in my house. So I, I actually always see this picture. But but you know, it's a, it's a peasant dish that is traditionally it's made with stale bread. You know, like leftover bread that is, is very dry. Uh, oregano is plentiful in, in Greece. And usually look for the overripe tomatoes that are on their way out. And if you're fancy like us, <laughs> you, you get to add feta cheese to it and some olive oil. But the idea was you just took everything down to the beach and, you know, you have long beach days, as you know, in Greece, right? You kind of get two beach days if you, if you want it, right? You yeah. got to kind of nap in between. But you just crack up this, this country bread, you, you crack it up open and you take salt water from the ocean and dab it that on was the, the bread. Ba- like that literally was the best, right? use salt water to season. Yeah. To exactly. clean the tomatoes and to season the exactly. bread. Exactly. Yeah. Clean the tomatoes, season the bread. And, uh, you know, and then, uh, you, you know, just traditionally, we didn't have a knife. We didn't do, you know, we just used our hand. We crushed the tomatoes on top of the bread and we put the oregano on there. And I have to post these pictures now <laughs> on the website. You do. And, and I feel like I remember, I feel like the lifeguard walked up to us, right? Yeah. Like he came out of his way. Yes. Because he smelled the oregano being crushed on the, on the beach. And he's like, I, I need to know yeah. what is what is going on yeah. here, and uh, you know, sure enough, we gave him son, and he's like, "This is this, you know, like my grandmother makes it like this, you know." So, but again, I was, uh, you know, I come from a long line of uh, chefs, you know, so I, I got you know all 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 the good recipes. It's awesome. Wait, but do you remember when we did the fake pilot? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! Of course, <laughs> because you've done a lot of um, competition shows, but you haven't won the competition right. shows? Yes. <laughs> Do you remember what the opening was? <laughs> the opening is like, um, the opening went something along like, hello, you may know me from Top Chef, uh, Iron Chef, Iron Chef America, Iron Chef Redemption. 
because uh, I lost every single one of those shows. So it was like, you know, we would just, the, you know, the joke was like, I'd just go through every show that I lost and got kicked out of them. Wait, but, do uh, you want to win one of these shows? Or why do you do these shows? I know you can cook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I feel like I, I, uh, I think I have a problem with taking it so serious. Yeah. You know, when I go on these, on these shows, like I feel like there's guys that just really want the win. And, and, you know, they're going to do anything for it. And, and I just, I've never been that type of person. I've never wanted to like, you know, I don't know. Like I, I like winning, but, but I like having a good time and I like having memories and, you know, it's, it's, uh, I mean, sure. I'd love to win one of these shows, but I don't think I'm going to be doing any more. <laughs> First of all, I'm not being asked to do anymore. So, uh, I don't, I don't even think it's my choice, but, um, but people know you from top chef. And I know you had this, you have like a serious fine dining background. You've yeah. cooked in like other countries, but yeah, it's like, oh, I know Spike from Top Chef and now he has Burger Place and Pizza Place and Taco Shop. How do you apply that training to what you're doing now? Yeah. Well, yeah, I think like, I don't think, you know, I don't think most people would know me as like a fine dining chef that was like classically trained and did, you know, did the apprenticeships, you know, just like Jack Pepin did and like, you know, all those guys. But, uh, and I don't think a lot of people know that I've been in the business since I was an infant, you know, from three generations of Greek families from Montreal. So, you know, when I, when I apply like that type of training to a fast casual concept, it's really all about ba- like, you know, I think the success of the, the restaurants we've opened are, is the balancing of flavors, right? It's just like, I've, you know, you get to play with people's palates when you do fine dining food, right? That's all you're thinking about. It's like, how am I going to balance the sweet with the, the salty and the spicy and what's going to characterize this dish the most? And if you apply that just to a burger, you come out with some really, really delicious burgers, right? So for instance, like the Obama burger we made, it was, I think, a perfect example of that where we had, you know, we had this great blend of meat and we wanted some textures and some really poppy flavors. And we did a red onion marmalade that was sweet, uh, a blue cheese that was salty, a horseradish mayo that was tangy and apple smoked bacon that was smoky so you had a lot going on a lot of flavors and textures and you know i think that's how you apply it's it's not you know i'm not building rockets or anything it's just like yeah. it's just like a very simple ac- application of like good delicious flavors to food that's just in the mainstream you how, know? how did you you have a, a mayo bar yeah. at good stuff eatery your burger place is that at every good stuff yes it's part of the the thing it's part Why? of the gig well, you know, it's always nice to have like a little free view away, right? Where you, you know, and and the Mayo Bar is based off of, you know, I I lived in Luxembourg and worked in Luxembourg and traveled through Belgium, and the frites and sauce was something that was I was always about. We even had that. We had kind of grew up with that in Montreal too. Yeah, so we do a Mayo Bar for our frites. So like our fries from Good Stuff Eatery are it's an aged potato that comes from Canada. We cook, you know, double fry it, and and uh, people have like sriracha mayo. We have uh, old bay mayo, uh, and we have a uh, um, uh, chipotle mayo. And then our best seller is our mango mayo. Is it really? We're, yeah, it is. Like, well, it's not even I've a seller. It. I've had it. Yeah, it's not even like it's, we give it's it away. Free, yeah. but people take I a like, lot of it. I like it. I like, I like the sweet in my savory personally. Yeah. So. yeah. So so do I. I mean, we how love, are they? Like, is chipotle like? pureed chipotle's mango pureed mango yeah so we so the mango it, it, it's kind of a, a mango chutney hmm. right so it's sweet cooked down like mango like so it's like a chutney that we puree with with mayonnaise same thing with sriracha the sriracha is uh, sriracha and condensed milk to balance it balance out the spice a little bit uh old bay you know, that one has like lemon and Old Bay and a little bit of cayenne and, you know, so they're really nice. delicious. Baby Ace, how old is he now? He's 21 months. Almost two. How's his palate? Dude, my kid's palate is amazing. Really? It's amazing. Does he eat every, like you, when you cook, he eats everything? The kid eats absolutely everything. And it's like, I was trying to describe this to somebody else the other day and like they were, they were really like... Of course, dude. They're like, you're like a chef. Like, you, you, like, you know. But I feel like it could go one way or the other. It, it could be could. like, he doesn't touch anything. And you're like, what the hell? Right. That's what I thought. So <laughs> I was like, I've, I almost feel like this whole food thing is just like his thing without right. like influence from me at all. It's just like, 
He's just like born a foodie and like, and the other part of it is that not only does he love like food and he eats everything, like I'm talking about cornichons, Brussels sprouts, beets, huh. uh, steak, chicken, fish, uh, scallop. I mean, anything you put in front of him, like he, he goes, mmm. <laughs> and then his table etiquette is like, on top of like that's like a whole other thing that like I never even realized he would have like this is so awesome it's like knife and fork and spoon and like you know and he he knows how to eat properly and it's does he watch you when you cook it's a joy yes yeah yeah he does he 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 has his own little play kitchen so when <laughs> I cook he like comes to the he, you know he spends time from the kitchen like my kitchen going to his kitchen. And like, He's like Daddy, I made and, you a, he brings you like a plastic. Yeah, burger. he brings a plastic everything <laughs> and wants you to eat it. He's also like notorious for stealing all our food. Like, just the other day here I, at the pool, you know, we were lying down and I got this great like uh, ham and cheese croissant uh, from Rosetta Bakery. Have you it, been there? Is that the place right on? Dude, Lincoln? there's a line. Yeah, uh, right, right here. Yeah, on Collins. Yeah, it lines around the corner right. every morning. It's on Collins or on the corner of like 17th or. It's on the on on the corner of Lincoln and Collins. Yes, right here. Yes, there's a line out the door every morning. Yes, we got I got coffee there the other day. It's delicious stuff. Anyways, he stole my he stole it out of my hand and like just ate the whole thing. You know, I'm like <laughs> like a whole. You like, you're you? like so happy, but you're like. You just took that whole thing, dude. Exactly. So it's like bittersweet. Like, I kind of want to eat that, but you're so damn cute. So. That's so funny. You're kind of Greek, as you mentioned, kind of Jewish, kind of Canadian. I'm Gruish Canadian <laughs> guy. How does this affect your food or personality? Um, I Did you don't grow know. up in Montreal? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I, I grew up in Montreal, and then, um, you know, uh, I grew up in you know, big Greek family. Uh, uh, my mother married a Jewish man. Were they in the restaurant business in Montreal? Oh yeah, still in the restaurant business in Montreal. I sat with you and your mom once outside at uh, We The Pizza and I remember like hearing her go off on business things about the menu and menu mix and I was like, I remember I asked you, is your mom in the business? And you turned to her, you're like, mom, he just asked if you were in the business. <laughs> <laughs> and she cut my head off. Yeah. Now she's a gangster in the business. Like she comes from, uh, I mean, like, uh, you know, her gra- her father, my grandfather and four brothers had a massive restaurant group in, in Montreal, still do. And she was trained in the hard knocks of the, that, that whole circle. You know, imagine like five Greeks, you know, being, you know, she had to work all those hours and... So like she, you know, we used to cook on the line together for years. Like hmm. my mother, I used to cook on the line with my mother. Like really? In, in, oh yeah, for years, for years. She, you know, she would expedite and and she run circles around you or what? I mean, she she's pretty. She's pretty. She knows what she's doing. Like you know, she's she's not only a home cook, but she's like a professional restaurant. Have chef. you learned a lot of lessons from mom? And dad's in uh, it, or he's is he dad accounting pulled, side or dad? got pulled into it because of from my mother he was a, an accountant but we can use accountants in the <laughs> restaurant business right <laughs> for sure <laughs> so so uh you know he just applied his his stuff to the restaurant business all the front of the house wheel and deal in the deals and like together they made a really good team so growing up like between my greek family in montreal and the travels to spain and like i was always surrounded by restaurants really so were there family dinners or were you just like always in restaurants I mean, we had family dinners a lot in the restaurants, you know, like time to sit down in our own restaurant and, and eat. Right. Uh, but I mean, yeah, I mean, there was always a home cooked meal in, in my house. My mother still to this day cooks my father a home cooked dinner. Like Every, Greek or just everything? Everything. Yeah. You know, she'll wake up in the morning, she'll make a meal, and later on that night they'll have it. Uh, you know, you know, sometimes it's like aluminum kicking, you know, but usually it's like a roast or, or something that could sit. And, uh, but yeah, still every day they, they have every day she cooks dinner. Wow. I know it's pretty amazing. Right? Yeah. yeah. That doesn't happen very often no. anymore. Yeah. Every day. She'll, unless they're going out the show, you know, what was your first restaurant job? What was it? Was it in Canada? Yeah, it was in Canada. What was, was it? Well, I mean, I, I played restaurant job in Canada, right? I was a little too young. I wasn't really getting paid, but my grandfather always had me in the kitchen on the salad station or busing tables or dishwashing. And then when we moved to Spain, I, I had, you know, a paying restaurant job there. And, and then really, I, I grew up in my parents' restaurant called Pepin's in St. Petersburg, Florida. I was there for 30 years. It was fine dining Spanish. And that's, that's like the restaurant I did everything in. Obviously, people learn from their mistakes and with industry ups and downs, which if you work in a restaurant, you have them. 
what would you say you've learned from a mistake? I mean, you like you said, you kind of recently closed a restaurant. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, the funny thing about this business is that it's always evolving. Right, and there's fads, there's trends, there's new talent, there's new concepts, there's new everything, there's new policies, tipping. I mean, it's ever evolving. So, you know, the name of the game is just to try to keep up and 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 do what you do and do it well. And 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 but through that, there's always mistakes. I think like the the greatest lesson in the business is, you know, you have to be at your restaurants. Right, you have to like, you have to be there. If you're gonna be in the restaurant business, you gotta show face, you gotta, no one's gonna treat your businesses like you do. It's very much, you know, my parents always said like, you know, the restaurant business was show business. Is there like their famous, you know, quote that I always kind of stuck with me, like, we're in show business, you know, like my, you know, if that's said my family like had photos of like famous people that they took pictures with, like in the restaurant, right? They were always there, like entertaining, schmoozing. And I think that's why I actually closed one of my restaurants. You know, I, I was consumed by Top Chef. I did all these fast casual concepts, good stuff eatery, we the pizza. Uh, concepts that don't really, you don't need to be as a chef owner, you don't need to be on the line every single day, you know? And then I, I was tired of being the burger chef, you know, or the top chef guy. So I wanted to do something a little serious. So I opened up a Bernays, beautiful restaurant, delicious menu. But you know, like I did that one mistake that, you know, like I've always told people never to do. And, and that's like, I couldn't be at the restaurant all the time. You know, and I couldn't manage it the way I wanted to. So it was trying to manage it from afar through email, through phone, and it just wasn't conducive. And it's not like, you know, that's not what you make a successful restaurant. You see these guys that are doing like really like eccentric food and like killing it and getting these, they're, they're there every day. So, so I, you know, I've, my, I've, I learned that my space is probably right now in my life more in a fast casual lane or a consulting lane. I can't, you know, I'm not, I'm not opening up a restaurant to do like the Spike Mendelson food every day. What's the name of the new taco place again? Santa Rosa. Santa Rosa. Which is doing great. Yeah. We opened up in its place. And it's like, it, you walk up to the counter and order? Yeah, you walk up to the counter and order. We have margaritas, we have specials, we, you know, we got burritos if you want. And these are all, these are all in the same block, right? Yeah, or they're one, two, three on the same block. Yeah, 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 yeah That's yeah. nice. Yeah, that is great. <laughs> I mean, we got all like three important fruit groups, you know? Yeah, like, for burger, sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, so social impact and giving back obviously a big part of Beyond the Plate, which you do a ton of. Yes. DC Food Policy Council, DC Central Kitchen, much more. So why do you do it? Why do I do it? Well, you know, I think, the like I was saying, the business is like evolving a lot, right? A lot of chefs. And, and I, I felt like we went through like this rock star phase, right? Where we're all being celebrated. Oh, we're the new rock stars, this and that. And then like that lasted a while, but... I felt like then we started seeing like a lot of these guys doing some great policy work, like Michelle Nishan, right? Uh, Tom Colicchio, Jose. Um, There's definitely guys before their times too, but it wasn't as celebrated. And then, you know, for me personally, I was traveling, you know, after Montreal, I had traveled every two years, I moved somewhere different. And DC was really becoming my home. And I felt like a lot of support, I got a lot of support from the community in DC and a lot of support from like the neighborhood. So, and then you meet a lot of politicians and you, young staffers that come into your restaurants because I'm on Capitol Hill and they're there doing things for their, you know, their, their delegation or what have you. And I felt like I needed to kind of give back, you know, in some shape or form. So that's kind of how I got started uh, with giving back and working with communities. And now, you know, uh, it's become this thing that I never thought it would be where, you know, I'm doing a lot of serious policy work in DC and internationally and, and all it, food policy related. Yeah, it's all food par- policy related. So for me, I, I, I chair the food policy council in DC on behalf of the mayor. And that's a piece of legislation that was written by council, a council member where the, the whole legislation its purpose is to better the food system. Uh, locally, but since we're in DC, kind of paved the way on how to do it everywhere, right? So we want to be, you know, a symbol for 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 national food policy. Uh, but really, what it is is we work. You know, we have, we 
here in DC, we break it up in four different groups. We work on sustainable agriculture, urban farming, local food and bu- small businesses, and then food deserts uh, and education, bettering the places that don't, that don't have affordable food, don't have a lack of education, and really trying to figure out what hurdles stand the way, in the way of them getting better grocers or better retail stores to invest in their neighborhoods. You know, what we can do be- better for the small business owners, how we can open up more land, plots of land that are government owned for urban farming, uh, and how we can do distribution better for sustainable agriculture. So, you know, and really what we do is the policy, the council brings all existing food policy that's been happening in DC under an umbrella to kind of work together rather than separately. And then what we do is we write legislation, right? We're not like an advocacy arm or anything like that. We're, We're actually put in place to write legislation and have like that serious effective change where people can take advantage of the legislation that we wrote. So, so that's kind of the gig in DC. That's uh, a lot. It's a lot and it's, it's huge and you're starting to see food policy councils pop up everywhere. You have an awesome one in LA, privately funded. Diff- what, what, which one is that? It's called it's the LA Food it's Policy. LA, okay. Yeah, LA Food Policy Council. And it's privately it. funded, and they do a lot of great. They, you know, they had a lot of success in like reforming school lunches over there. For instance, Baltimore has been is known like their big thing on their food policy council is opening up plots of land for urban farming that are city owned. Um, you know, there's a lot of good things. Um, you know, this year we're actually hosting our food policy council is going to host all other food policy directors and we're going to go lobby on behalf of the farm bill in DC together. Nice. So like there's, you know, there's cool effective change. Um, and then, you know, care is awesome, awesome work too. It's international work. Uh, it's mainly, it's mainly doing, it's more of an advocacy arm. And I mean, they have, a, I, my part of it is advocacy. They have effective change, right? So, uh, it's really going like, so far I've done two trips. We went to Mozambique and Peru where we, um, you know, we invest in smallhold farmers and, and try to change the narrative and empower women a little bit more, uh, where they're regarded as, you know, ladies that just should t- take care of the household, but actually they're the providers of everything in the household. So, you know, it's, we, we do it in many different ways. So, And I feel like that's a full-time job almost. Yeah, it, it, it's... Um, I balance it out pretty well, yeah. you know, like uh, I, I, I do as much as I can, you know, with the time I have, but, but uh, you know, I'm lucky I'm in DC. It's kind of like, you know, where it's all happening. Right. Uh, so it's in my backyard. Uh, I think I get to devote a lot more time to it just, just ge- because I'm ge- geographically positioned better. And, you know, you have a lot of chefs though that, you know, God bless them. They're, they're traveling to DC once or twice a month to, to do their work, you know, and they're get, jumping on the train and they're jumping on a plane and, and meeting with people. So that's awesome. Keep it up. Let's do a speed round. You've had some big policy guys on here too, right? We Chef have, policy, yeah. yeah. We talked with Colicchio um, about a lot of the work he does. Jose Andres was our bookend to season one, which, I mean, I, that dude. He's an animal. Yeah. He's, he's I mean, I, I lo- you know, I, I love him. Yeah. yeah. Honestly, it's part of the reason why I started this is because traveling how I do for work and talking to these chefs, you hear all the different ways they give back and why. And some of them it's because, I mean, geographically speaking, in your community, it works. For Scott Conant, he does it because one of his best friends has this foundation. I mean, you guys all can go to an event a night if oh, yeah. you wanted to accept every invitation, yeah. you know? And then there's chefs who, you know, Bayless, who has his own foundation or three different ones, I think he yeah. has. <laughs> yeah. And Rachel, you know, is through animals and through cooking and kids. So everyone is different, but everyone is also so interesting. And I feel like people come into your restaurant and they're like, good stuff, eatery is the best burger in DC or mushroom <laughs> mushroom <laughs> pie, we the pizza is <laughs> sick. And, but like that's what they know you for in yeah. a way. And I think in DC people know you for more than that. But I think in general, there's so much more behind. I mean, food is crazy. Yeah. And people are just going from restaurant to restaurant and new restaurant. They want the best and newest and the Instagram photo of this and that. And there's way more to you all than 
than that. Oh yeah, a lot of depth. And some people have no clue. People, I had someone (laughs) text me the other day, they said they were listening to Michael Solomonoff and they got, they were getting emotional and teary eyed (laughs) taking the subway in New York. I'm like, believe it or not, you're the second guy to email me saying they got teary eyed on the subway listening to the podcast (laughs) in New York. He's like, correction, second guy that's admitted it. That's what you want to hear. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right. What did you have for dinner last night? Dinner last night it was here at the Lowe's. I had a roast chicken. Yeah, was it good? It's actually delicious. Yeah, they get, they get nice little little hens. I don't know where they're getting them from, but but uh, I forgot to ask. But it was like beautiful roast chicken, nice grilled lemon, served on a cast iron. I think they served me a little like side of chicken fat. Really, chicken fat with it, so I could dip the chick the roast chicken in. I love that. Like the schmaltz. Yeah, it was delicious. It's great. Name a smell in the kitchen you love. Stock. Name chicken a, stock. Chicken stock. Name a smell in the kitchen you hate. Brussels sprouts. <laughs> <laughs> it's cooked. Cool, yeah. Roasted. What pisses you off in the kitchen? Um, what pisses me off in the kitchen is, uh, I mean, working dirty. Mm-hmm. Like dirty pans. Like I'm a, a pretty much of a neat freak in kitchens. So, yeah. What makes you happy in the kitchen? Rhythm, you know, good, good, a nice little, some good music, a good rhythm to the kitchen. You know, when everything's working well, yeah. it's working well. And I'm like just making this stuff out of my head though, because I haven't been in the kitchen in years. <laughs> so I'm like, wait, I remember I liked, I used to like beef stock, the smell of beef stock. And yeah. But, but you're, you have fast casual kitchens. I mean, yeah, no, I, I mean, you the know, hum I, of your, of like good stuff at lunch hour on Capitol yeah, Hill. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there's, there's, you know, there's a, there's an awesome vibe of the restaurants that we have. And it's like when, you know, what, what we strive to do on the Hill is like, we want to have great music, something that's upbeat. We want to have action. We have open kitchens. Yeah. We want to have a line, you know, we want people smushed together, like feeling like, you know, like it's fun. So, you know, um, yeah, like a, a nice little vibe. Yeah. All right. You're 37, 37, 37. You accomplished a lot. What's on the chef bucket list? Woo, uh, <laughs> chef bucket list right now. Well, you know, as as crazy as it seems, I would like to do like a small like forty seat restaurant at some point. Uh, but later, not now. Uh, I think I I still want to get like like find like nicer like yeah yeah I want to I you know I've never done you know even Bernays was a concept restaurant. Right, you know, heavily on concept, like a steak feet restaurant, brasserie, what have you. I've never really opened up a restaurant that just is like, you know, my food from like all my backgrounds or, you know, and like it's not really driven by like a Mediterranean feel or this or that. It's just like a little culmination of me. So, but I, you know, I never want, uh, I think later in life, so maybe 10 years from now or something like that. We'll see. Sweet. Yeah, that's on the bucket list. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, dude. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. Quote, the funny thing about this business is it's always evolving. The name of the game is to try to keep up and do what you do and do it well. But through that, there was always mistakes. Thanks again to Chef Spike Mendelson. Find more on him at chefspike.com. Join us next week when Beyond the Plate presents Just the Plate, a short segment where chefs describe a dish or a recipe that is meaningful to them. Find me and keep up to date with this podcast across all social media platforms at On Cappy's Plate or go to beyondtheplatepodcast.com. Beyond the Plate is on Twitter at BT Plate Podcast and Facebook. Thank you to our partner, IL8 by Flavor Gallery, who supplied all of our signature hats and t-shirts to our Beyond the Plate guests. These will be coming to the IL8 by Flavor Gallery site soon. This episode is brought to you by our friends at the National Mango Board. The National Mango Board is a national promotion and research organization, which is entirely supported by assessments from domestic and imported mangoes. Basically, their mission is to increase consumption of fresh mangoes in the U.S. through research and promotional activities. My wife happens to be a huge fan of mangoes, and I just had mangoes on a delicious dessert just last night at Stephanie Izard's Duck Duck Goat restaurant. It was a mango coconut cloud dessert, a coconut sponge cake with diced up mango and dragon fruit and kiwi. And it was delicious, but I was with my friend and his little baby named Olive, and Olive loved the mango so much that I didn't get to eat 
any of it barely because she was reaching for all the bright yellow, juicy, delicious mango. I also love mango and smoothies and salsas, Thai mango sticky rice, which I mentioned last time that I can't get enough of when I see it on the Thai menu. By the way, how about Chef Spike's use of mangoes on his mango bar at Good Stuff Eatery? Some tips for you. Look for mangoes not by sight, but by feel, because some mangoes are green and others are red. So the feel is actually what determines the ripeness, not the color. Squeeze them gently, they will give slightly. And also many people think they're only available in the summer season, but there are actually six varietals of mango available in the US, meaning you can always find the right mango in your supermarket any time of year. To learn more about the National Mango Board or how to cut a mango, for instance, visit mango.org. You can find them on Instagram at mango board or on Twitter at mango underscore board. National Mango Board, we thank you. This episode was produced by me, along with Ian Cohen, Joe Yeaton, and Sean Petrosian. Our music has been composed by Goldford. As always, special shout out to my wife, Katie. Please rate, review, and or subscribe to this podcast on your listening site of choice. Thank you for listening to Beyond the Plate. I'm Cappy, and remember, there are never too many cooks in the kitchen.